Good morning again. Good to see you. Everything all right? Did you have a good week? Or did you have a great week? Great. Glad to hear that. All right. Philippians chapter 3, please. We're going on a search this morning, looking for the true believer. Philippians 3, we will read verses 1 through 6 in Scripture. By the way, while I hear some more pages turning, let me say to those that are visiting, if this is your first time to visit, I'd love to see you afterwards, and we have a gift for you. And I've got it over here at this door, this uh, exit right here, and I'll meet you there after the worship service this morning for just a few moments, just to be able to shake your hand and say hey to you if I haven't done that. Love to do it. All right, beginning in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Your King James Bible says the concision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he ha may have more confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Let's just read verse 7 because it's there. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Father, I pray that you'll speak through me this morning. I pray that you'll give me an ability to express very clearly the truth of your word. I give you honor and praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I got on the computer this morning early and I googled counterfeit money. Now that may sound strange to you. I'm not in the business. I'm not looking for it. Although I will tell you this. This is fact. When you do that, if you google the words counterfeit money, about the third one down is how to print counterfeit money. And then right after that, two more down is a YouTube video on how to make counterfeit money. All right, now listen to me. If you do that and we go to court of law, I'm testifying against you because I'm telling you now, don't. All right? It was a problem we faced over and over and over again. By the way, I got 2,390,000 hits on, how, on counterfeit money this morning. But it was something that we faced more than once. I took one man down one time to change some money down at the roundabout where the money changers were. And don't worry, Jim, I'm not taking you to these particular fellas. And he walked up there and he gave his $100 bill. And um, as we were leaving, that guy ran up behind us and said, Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, you gave me a bad bill. And he gave us a bill back, and he pulled one out of his pocket and gave him another $100 bill. Well, the scoundrel of a money changer had a counterfeit bill, and he palmed it off on the guy that I took down to change money. Well, I turned to him, and I said, did you write down your serial numbers? He said, no. Well, did people tell you to write down the serial numbers? Yes. Uh, duh. You know? then why didn't you write them down? Well, I didn't think I would need to. Folks, that's a real problem. There are a lot of counterfeits out there in this country. As a matter of fact, I found six different news items from within the United States in the past 24 hours about counterfeiters across the United States of America. This is serious. This is serious stuff. But may I tell you something more serious more serious is the counterfeiting that goes on in the church. There are counterfeits within the church today. They look like the real deal. They smell like the real deal. They sound like the real deal. 
They seem like the real deal, but they're counterfeits. When you get up close and you take a good look from up close, you find out they are not, they are not the real deal. And you need to beware. And so I want to show you this morning about three enemies every Christ follower needs to avoid. You need to watch out for these particular ones. The first one that scriptures mentioned were dogs. Beware of dogs. Now may I tell you something? There are two words in the Greek language that they use for dogs. One of them is your little puppy dog that you have at home. Y'all seen that television commercial about that girl that thinks living is having 637 friends on Facebook and she's sitting in front of her computer and says, Oh, that's a puppy. That's not a puppy. You know, that little kind of animal is not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about another kind. We're talking about wild dogs this morning. In fact, the words that's used there are dogs that describe scavenger dogs and noisy dogs and pack dogs and, and uh, attack dogs. These kind of animals you will find in the Old Testament that every time they spoke of the enemies of the Lord, they spoke of them as being dogs. Every single time. These curs that were out there that ran about and they would, they would attack. One of our friends was walking across a large park up in the mountains of Peru one day. One of our missionaries. And he's just walking along. And from a distance of, of more than double of where I am, uh, uh, back where the Chadwicks are sitting back there in the back, more than double of that, this dog came running with everything it had and ran across. And that fellow's wearing his uh, cargo shorts and his hiking boots and everything that everybody else did that lived up there in that part of the country in those mountains and grabbed him on the calf of his leg. That dog bit him with everything he had and punctured his skin. And they took him down to the hospital. Problem was, my friend didn't speak Spanish. He had just come into the country. He had been in the country a whopping two months, had not had one lesson in Spanish. He could say see sí and no. And that was it. And then he would have to look at you and see if that was really what he needed to say at the moment. And they found me, and I went down and helped the man get out of the jam that he was in before they proceeded to give him a series of rabies shots because he had already had rabies vaccines before he came in the country. This is the kind of animal that I'm speaking about when, I, when you see that. That's the phraseology that's used here when it says, Beware of dogs. And that is one of the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're speaking about there. Not only should we beware of dogs, we should beware of evil workers. Evil workers are those who believe and teach salvation by work. Evil workers are those who trust in their rituals and those who trust in, in their own personal prayers. You know, I have met with so many people through the years and I begin to talk to them about their salvation and they say, yeah, man, I'm telling you 10, 15 years ago, I prayed this prayer that somebody told me to pray. Well, congratulations. You know, I can remember the first time I prayed. I was four years old sitting at the dinner table. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Y'all remember that? Y'all done that before? When you have folks that trust in ritual and trust in those kinds of things, you have a person, when they tell you that's the way you need to go and you're going to be all right with God, that's where you find yourself in trouble. I want to tell you something. Run, just run these things up, Sean. I want you to understand some truth uh, this morning about these evil workers. They will deceive you and lie to you. They're false teachers. They teach you to place your faith in the wrong thing. They want you to have faith in faith. They want you to have faith in your confession. If you confess success, it must happen. If you say it's going to happen, then ladies and gentlemen, it's got to happen. That's how they speak to you. And they speak to you with all kinds of energy. And they tell you, why, well, based on the Word of God, the Word of God says where you put your feet, that's your possession. Confess it this morning. 
And it makes God sick to his stomach. Actually, I think he laughs. Misplaced faith, ladies and gentlemen, is a dangerous thing. Amen? These are legalistic people and these are ritualistic people that, that we face out there. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers who are false teachers. Beware of the mutilation. Beware of these mutilators. Now this is something that the Scripture spoke of very clearly and, and, and it's more in depth in the book of Galatians. This was a problem that uh, they followed and faced in those days. Paul had already dealt with this some ten years earlier when he dealt with the Galatian church. And uh, Paul had already... Uh, attacked this head on and these people followed him over and over and over. They were the ones who said you must mix the law with the Lord Jesus Christ in order for you to be born again. And you say, well, we don't do that. Don't we? If I walk through here and I were to ask and do an interview this morning, just grab the microphone and do one of those things where these guys run out in the audience and they do interviews, and, and I were to stick the mic in front of your mouth and say, what does it take for you to be spiritual? How would you answer that question this morning? You would have some that would say, well, for me to be spiritual, I have to pray this many minutes a day. You had have others who would say, for me to be spiritual, I have to go to church this many times a week. Now, I want to tell you something. The more you spend in the Word of God and with the family of God, the better off you are. Amen? I think three times a week is not enough. You want to be honest. The Scripture says, do it all the more as you see the day approaching. And I think we need to be more diligent to be studying the Word of God together, not less diligent. I praise God for the 34, 30-something-odd people that are going to be gathering at 4.30 this afternoon and, and going to meet and, and study uh, biblical principles about marriage. Praise God for that. We need to study as often as we can. We need to get together. But that's not going to make you spiritual, ladies and gentlemen. That doesn't mean you're spiritual. It does mean you're hungry. It does mean you're interested, but it does not mean you're spiritual by no means. You see, anybody who mixes something that you can do with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ has fallen into this category of, of, of a mutilator. The mutilators were the ones who said you must be circumcised in order to be born again. You can have Jesus all you want, but if you don't do this outward sign, there's nothing. And there are people that say that today, except they point to the baptistry and they say, you must be baptized by immersion in order to be born again. Now, anyone who's born again will be baptized. The Scripture teaches that. But that baptism will not save you, ladies and gentlemen. Only the blood of Jesus and the finished work of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and the good pleasure of God will save you this morning. That's all. So watch out for these guys. It's that church called Jesus Plus. Jesus Plus, any kind of works you want to stick in there. That's the mutilators that we're speaking about this morning. The church of Jesus Plus. Plus. So beware of the mutilators. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilators. But be aware at the same time. And I'm going to show you this morning, now that I have unsuccessfully shown you what these, what these fellows are like, I'm going to show you three characteristics this morning that describe a true Christ follower. There's a threefold evidence that's there. Now, really and truly, aren't you glad the Bible didn't stop? The Holy Spirit said, Paul, you need to tell the other side of this thing right here. And he just didn't start out negative, but he ended up positive in his statements here. In fact, he gets, he gets better and better and better as we go into Philippians. I told Graham just a moment ago, ask him to please the song, Knowing You, that we sang. Please save that for October 9th when I'm back in the pulpit after our mission work in Peru 
to sing that again because it's going to fit the text that we're going to be we're going to be uh, studying on October the 9th. So none of uh, the rest of you guys, you cannot preach from Philippians when you preach while I'm gone. You hear that? Don't you do it? I'll get you. All right. Let me give you these. Let me give you these. Uh, evidences that that he's shown here and let's find out what God's saying number one they worship God in the spirit and in truth by the way worship there is Lutreo and it describes not just worship as we're doing today it describes service as well and any service that you do to the glory of God is part of your worship that's what Scripture teaches. I want to give you some truth about worship. I want to move quickly because I want to concentrate on the very last one of these three characteristics he mentions. True worship is supernatural. True worship always originates with the Holy Spirit of God. That's why when you read Scripture, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation chapter 1, and you see passages like that and it tells you to pray in the Spirit and be in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit. All of this originates from God. You cannot fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear me. You cannot worship God without the Holy Spirit. You need the presence of the Holy Spirit in able for you to worship God because true worship is supernatural. True worship follows biblical principles. True worship is also Christ-centered. The Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen, never speaks about Himself. When the Holy Spirit speaks, the Holy Spirit always speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you teach, the Holy Spirit always teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ. When you witness, the Holy Spirit always witnesses about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit always takes a back seat and points the light on the Lord Jesus Christ. True worship is always Christ-centered. True worship has fruits of joy and peace. And true worship strengthens the worshiper. Nehemiah 8.10 tells us in the Scripture that the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. And when you get into the presence of God and you worship the God, uh, the God that I know, the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you can have a difficult life, you can have a hard day, you can have had a hard week, but I'm telling you, when you get in the presence of God, there's an inexplicable joy and peace that passes all understanding that will come over you. These folk, true followers of Christ, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. They not only do that, they rejoice in Christ Jesus. They rejoice in Christ Jesus. The word rejoice here is not be happy about. The word rejoice here is the word to brag about. That's what the word is. This particular use of the word rejoice means to brag. It means to make your boast in another. Some of y'all want to brag about, um, well, our Mississippi State folks aren't bragging this week, are they? And our Ole Miss folks aren't bragging this week, are they? But our Mississippi State folks are bragging about Ole Miss this week, aren't they? And our USM folks are quietly bragging this week, hoping that next week will also be good. You know what I'm saying? But you're bragging about your teams. You see what I'm saying, Mr. Purvis? You see what I'm saying? You're bragging about your teams this week. Well, let me tell you who to brag about this week. Brag about Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. True Christ followers brag about the Lord Jesus Christ. True Christ followers keep their eyes on Jesus and that's what makes them happy and fulfilled in this life is the Lord Jesus himself. True Christ followers don't worry about how good the preacher was. They don't worry about who the worship leader is. They don't worry about the worship genre on a given time. They don't worry about the choir. They have their eyes on Jesus. And they get happy. Fellow showed up in a Scottish church and he walks through the door 
And he's sitting back there in the back in this church in Scotland. And he heard a great message and he said, Well, praise God, being the good gringo American that he was. And one of the deacons turned around and tapped him on the shoulder and says, We don't do that here. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. When it doesn't matter who's preaching, when you hear Jesus, you get excited about it. Because you want to brag on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me pull the car over and park for a minute. Yeah, I know what time it is. True Christ followers have no confidence in the flesh. They have no confidence in the flesh. Now... I don't know why, as I studied this, with all that there is, and, and, and folks, listen to me. I personally, what I just said about bragging on Jesus, I think every message ought to run to Jesus as fast as it can. But the Holy Spirit wants us to understand something, I think, this morning about the flesh. And I have to share some things with you this morning about the flesh that may or may not sit well with you. If you're not... If you're not living according to the flesh, if you're living according to the Spirit of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to say, yeah. But if you're living according to the flesh, you're going to say, you meddling. <laughs> you know, so get ready to classify yourself. We're about to find out where we're sitting this morning. They have no confidence. A true Christ follower has no confidence in the flesh. And let me show you how the flesh shows up and takes credit in our lives. Let me just show that to you. Uh, well, you have Samson who depended on his physical strength. And if you read the story of Samson in the book of Judges, there you find this man. And, and you know, we've always in all of our movies see this guy, an Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of guy, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was young. And uh, you see him out there, and he's all the rock, Dwayne Johnson, you know. He's all bulked up, and he's looking, he's looking pretty buff. And, and, you know, when you look at him, he doesn't have guns. He's got cannons and and the whole nine yards, and there he is, just, just rippled out. I don't think that's what Samson was like. I think Samson was kind of like maybe this, <laughs> you know. And, uh, of course, he was a Nazarite, so his hair's hanging down on his shoulders. Where'd Dan Lockett go? Where, where, Dan, Dan, where are you hiding, Dan? He go out of the room right now? You know, you remember Dan years ago when Dan wore his hair down to here, you know? That's a Nazarite vow when you got your hair like that and for the men, you know. And, and so there he was, and, he, and uh, this power of the Lord would come upon him. And he got to where he was pretty happy with that strength. I mean, he could kill a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass or any other politician that might be up there. And, and he, could, um, he, could, um, uh, he could do all of these things, and he tied foxes' tails together and set them through a field and set the field on fire, and he did all these sorts of things. But then he met a woman named Delilah, and uh, when they said, the Philistines are upon you after she had cut his hair off after he revealed the secret, and that wasn't the only reason he lost his strength. I don't have time to preach the whole thing. Don't want to take time, that is. And... Um, when that happened, Samson in that moment stood up and he didn't know the power of the Lord had left him. And he shook himself as he did every other time and he found out, I'm in a heap of trouble. He trusted in his physical strength. And it did him absolutely no good whatsoever. Some people trust in their physical strength. Well, that, that's not just their physical strength. You know, when you depend on your talents and your intelligence and that sort of thing, you're also, you're also in that dangerous place that Samson was in. And I know folks that depend on their intelligence. And you've got to, I know preachers that way, you've got to listen to me because I'm smart. You have to listen to me because I... I'm this, that, or there. Let me tell you something, man. Some of the best men I've ever heard preach never went to seminary. But they knew Jesus. And that's where it is. It's knowing Jesus. I didn't say don't go to seminary, guys. I have a doctorate from a seminary. So I didn't say don't go to seminary. 
I'm telling you, if you think that's what's going to give you standing before God, you've got problems. Sharpen your axe, Nick. Matt, where'd you go, son? There you are. Sharpen your axe, brother. Get all the education God will let you get so you can cut with a sharp axe. But don't think that's going to give you standing before God because it doesn't. Some people have confidence in a social status. Book of James says the rich would come to church and they'd walk past everyone. It wasn't a Baptist church, I know this, because they wanted to sit on the front row. But they would look for it and they insisted. They insisted <clears throat> on their social status. They wanted to be wealthy. <clears throat> and they wanted everybody to know how wealthy they were and that they must be right with God because they have money. Money is not an evidence of God's blessing. If it were, then Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and George Soros and, and that Mexican guy over there who's r richer than they are, all of these guys, all of these guys would be the most spiritual people in the planet. You know what I'm saying? Money is not a measure necessarily of God's blessing. It may be, but it's not a measure of spirituality for sure. It's not. Social status doesn't get it, ladies and gentlemen. And then you have those who have pride in their heritage. This is what we read in Philippians 3 when we were speaking about Paul and all that Paul insisted there. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was, when it comes to the law, I was a Pharisee. There was nobody more uh, prepared than I was when it comes to all of these things. And he looked at all of his heritage there and he says, it's just a bunch of bunk. Every bit of it is just a bunch of bunk when it comes to knowing Jesus. It's just not there. And so when you have pride in your religious heritage or your ethnic heritage or your national heritage or your political heritage and you're having confidence in that, that God must hear you because you're an American, I'm telling you, you've missed it! When you think God must hear me because I'm a southerner, you missed it. When you think God's going to hear you because you're, you're white, black, brown, yellow, red, it doesn't matter to me, you missed it. Heritage has nothing to do with it. And when you have confidence in the flesh, you're in trouble. You've climbed into the wrong railroad car and you're headed the wrong direction. Let me tell you quickly what the flesh does, the truth about the flesh, biblical principles. And you can just write these down about as fast as I'm going to say them. No good thing dwells in the flesh, Romans 7, 18. The flesh serves the law of sin, Romans 7, 25. The things of the flesh and the things of the Spirit are diametrically opposed to one another, Romans 8, 5. The flesh wars against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, Galatians 5, 17. To follow the flesh is to be opposed of God, uh, opposed to God, Romans 8, 7. The flesh will pretend to be holy, but it's actually very self-righteous. The flesh collaborates with the devil every chance it gets, James chapter 1. And listen to this, it is impossible to please God with the flesh, Romans 8, 8. God must have heard me this morning because I'm so eloquent. God must have heard my prayer because I prayed for one solid hour today. I'm telling you, you must not have any confidence in the flesh whatsoever. In fact, what we need to do is repent of the deeds of the flesh and trust Jesus and Jesus alone. Watch out for false teachers, for false workers, for the church of Jesus plus. Place no confidence in any of your abilities, but always in the ability of our Lord Jesus Christ. And always in the finished work 
of our Lord Jesus Christ who completely and perfectly offered himself in your place and gives you salvation that you and I do not deserve. But our Lord Jesus said, Here, it's a gift. Receive me and you have the gift of eternal life. That is when you become a true Christ follower. When that happens in your life.